Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Bowling, and I'm the director of the Dresher Center for the Humanities, and I would like to welcome you to our third Humanities Forum event of this fall semester. We have the pleasure today of hearing our own visual arts professor, Fred Warden, speak about experimental filmmaking in the 21st century. But before I move on to introduce Professor Warden, let me remind you that in two weeks' time, we will be in the midst of celebrating Ancient Studies Week, and Betsy Bryan from Johns Hopkins will be speaking on cultic revelries in the Egyptian New Kingdom two weeks from today. And then in four weeks' time, we will have the History Department's annual web lecture, this year presented by Robert K. Webb himself on the very long 18th century, an experiment in the history of religion. Please pick up a calendar of our Fall Humanities Forum events located on the various tables and benches throughout the gallery. Now, one of the real pleasures of my role as director of the Dresher Center for the Humanities is getting to know a number of our UMBC colleagues across the campus. When I had lunch last year with Fred Warden to talk about the possibility of his talking to us and showing some clips of his films, I came away enervated and impatient that it would be so many months before he'd actually be speaking to us. But now this day is here, and so let me tell you a little about him. Professor Warden received his BA in English Literature from Colorado College and his Master of Fine Arts from California Institute of the Arts and Filmmaking. He has taught film and video at UMBC since 2001 and is currently a tenured associate professor of visual arts. Besides working in academe, he has been a gallery director and an associate editor in Boulder, Colorado. Fred Warden has created some 25 films which have been shown at more than 100 film festivals and other venues across Europe and the United States, as well as Mexico, Canada, Hong Kong, and Thailand. I made the mistake of beginning to print out his CV, and I realized I didn't have enough paper. It was amazing. His films have been highlighted in 20 curated solo exhibitions. Most recently, the May-June 2010 issue of Film Comment magazine ran an article titled Avant-Garde Poll, in which they ranked the top 50 experimental filmmakers for the years 2000 to 2009. Fred Warden was ranked number 21 in that poll of film critics for that decade. A two-program retrospective of his films was a featured part of the Oberhausen Short Film Festival in Oberhausen, Germany this past May. At that same film festival, Professor Warden served as the American jury on the international, uh, the American juror on the international jury. His new film, Possessed, will screen in the 2010 New York Film Festival, Views from the Avant Garde, and will be shown this coming Sunday at Lincoln Center in New York City. So if you happen to be in New York, that's the place to be. 4.30, good. So please join me in welcoming Professor Fred Warden. Thank you, Rebecca. That was really, I hardly recognize that guy. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, my talk today is called After Hours in the Cerebral Kitchen. Uh, I picked this title um, partly because I think I really will do something like the kind of cooking shows I'm sure we've all seen on uh, broadcast television. Also, I wanted a context in which I could be a bit informal about how I presented these things I'm going to be talking with you about today. Um, <clears throat> so what I'd like to do here really is just uh, invite all of you into my cerebral kitchen. We'll poke around a little bit. I want to show you um, some of the ingredients that I've been working with to uh, make my own experimental films recently. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that and also about film in general. Uh, <clears throat> I do want to say this is after hours in the cerebral kitchen. <laughs> Uh, which means that these things I'm going to talk about, um, which I find quite fascinating, but um, they, they're not, it's not as if they've all coalesced in my own mind in some fixed, absolute set of relationships. I'm constantly sort of readjusting them. So in that sense, it really is like cooking. I have these ingredients, and I'm often testing recipes to see how they can go together. <coughs> so for today, I, I would like to just show you my ingredients and test a couple of recipes. And the... Um, Primary re recipes I want to address for the purposes of this talk are <coughs> recipes for cinematic continuity and cinematic motion. 
these are things I'm always looking for for my films, how to introduce continuity and motion. And uh, <clears throat> for purposes of today, I want to look in two areas particularly for ingredients for these recipes. I want to look into visual perception, first of all, how we see anything whatsoever. Then I want to spend a little time in early cinema, particularly looking at the very first film ever made. At least that's alleged by the textbooks to be the very first film. Uh, and after that, we'll just uh, hop over basically the entire history of cinema and land in the 21st century. And I will try to say something about experimental cinema, uh, how experimental cinema might work with continuity and motion. So that's where we're going. <laughs> and the first stop on this little excursion is visual perception. And I'm going to make three assertions about visual perception, and I make these as a filmmaker. The first is that visual perception is arguably a more powerful form of mentation or mentality than conceptual thought. And I'd like to give an example just to try to defend this assertion. I think there's many examples I could turn to, but I want to use this one because it applies to this situation. Rebecca introduces me. I come before you. I look out at the room. And the perceptual side of my brain, uh, and I'm going to be talking about these two sides of the brain, the unconscious perceptual side and the uh, conscious cognitive side. The unconscious perceptual side of my brain sends up into the conscious side of my brain seemingly instantaneously to me an accounting of which of the faces that I'm seeing out there are strangers to me and which faces are faces I know. Think about the mental processing involved in that uh, accounting. I give you this slide because I think these faces are roughly about the size of what your faces look like to me now. And my brain has to scan each and every one of your faces and then on the basis of rather small differences because faces are all uh, essentially the same, we share the same features, my brain has to decide, oh yes, that combination of nose, eyes, mouth, that's someone that's familiar to me, or this combination is not, that's a stranger. Uh, so that's my first assertion, that visual perception is a powerful form of intelligence. Uh, the second assertion will balance this a bit, uh, where I say that visual perception is lazy and rote. And what I mean by that is that when visual information comes in through the eyes and the brain is trying to understand that sensory information in order to figure out what it's seeing, it has this enormous uh, predisposition to want to understand that sensory data in terms of past experiences, familiar experiences. So that's something I'm going to be up against as a filmmaker. On the one hand, I'm interested in this uh, intelligence that I think is in perception but I'm going to be up against the fact that it's uh, almost entirely committed to simply recreating the familiar world. All right, that's the second assertion. The third and final assertion is that we do not see an objective world. Believing is seeing. Of course, to say believing is seeing is really just to turn around that familiar phrase, seeing is believing. I think believing is seeing is a more accurate description of what really goes on in perception. And in order to bring this home, I ask you to take a look at this visual illusion, see if you can figure out what's going on here. All right, I'm going to tell you what's going on here because time is short. Uh, <laughs> This is a mask, obviously it's rotating. The first thing you need to know is uh, the mask is only rotating in one direction. When the inside of the mask comes around and it appears to uh, change direction, that is a pure fabrication of the uh, perceptual side of your brain. Why does your brain do this? Brains are very good at extracting information about faces. But one thing perception is very committed to is noses stick out, cheekbones stick out. So when the inside of the mask comes around, the brain is facing a kind of dilemma. And it has what I imagine to, to be a, a conversation, that, something like this. Gee, that really looks like a face. Except the nose is sticking in and the cheekbones are sticking in. So in response to that dilemma, the brain fabricates a false picture of a face. It fabricates a face that accords with the brain's understanding of what it believes faces should look like. 
and it sends it up into your conscious mind. I offer you this illusion just to bring home at least uh, two points. One, your brain, my brain, is perfectly capable of delivering into your conscious mind a picture of the world that is very natural seeming, very familiar, very stable, and is completely false. <laughs> a second aspect of this illusion that interests me, and this interests me as a filmmaker, when the inside of the mask comes around and the brain produces this false face, I can almost understand this to be an act of creativity on the part of perception. It's creating this face almost entirely out of its own resources, and it's certainly doing it out of its own initiative. Uh, but once again, it's a creativity entirely uh, kind of uh, enslaved to the notion that its duty is to reproduce familiar pictures of the world. Uh, so that's a kind of mixed bag from my standpoint. I, I like the idea of creativity, but I'm going to have to try to release it in some way. And then the last thing about this illusion before we leave it, um, <coughs> isn't it interesting that on the conscious cognitive side of our brain, we understand fully what's going on here. Your brain understands in the conscious side that this is a mask, it has a concave and a convex side, but none of this knowledge of the truthfulness of this situation affects how we actually see it which is to say the information flow here is entirely one way. It's from perception up into the conscious mind, but there's no feedback going the other way. I mean, one might expect that uh, the conscious mind would want to send a message down to the perceptual mind saying, uh, wait a minute, I don't think you've got this quite right. Maybe you should rethink this or re-perceive this. No, perception is entirely indifferent to any message from the conscious mind. I'm interested in this because when I get to the 21st century, one of the things I'm going to suggest about these experimental films is that they uh, <clears throat> have the potential to be a kind of mechanism for the conscious side of the brain to get not just into dialogue with the unconscious perceptual side, but really get a kind of dynamic interaction going there. So that's something I want to follow up on when we get into the 21st century. I'm going to give you one more illusion and then we will uh, leave per perception behind. See if you can figure out what's going on in this scenario. <laughs> what's so funny? You may have noticed the guy in the blue shirt in the back there is laughing with a little bit less enthusiasm than the guy in the front. And that's because he's been made a, a kind of victim of what's called the rubber hand illusion. And I want to show you this illusion in some detail because I think the implications of this uh, illusion are really quite profound. Here's a kind of slow motion version of what's involved in the rubber hand illusion. Uh, think of the woman that's seated at the table as a subject in an experiment. The woman in the spot address is administering the experiment. The woman in the spot address has arranged the seated woman's arm so it's kind of behind that black barricade there. She's also put a black cloth on the woman's arm. All of that is so the woman, the seated woman, cannot see her own left hand and left arm. There's also a rubber prosthetic hand on the table. And what's going to happen now, the woman in the spot address is going to take two paintbrushes. And she's going to begin to simultaneously and synchronously stroke the finger of the rubber hand and also the woman's real hand but the hand she can't see. And subjects who go through this experiment report that after about 60 seconds of this stroking, they begin to feel odd tingling sensation in their shoulder and in their arm, and they suddenly feel that they've taken on that rubber hand as their own hand. Now, once again, the cognitive side of the brain fully understands it's just a rubber hand. But at the level of experience and perception, uh, there's a commitment to the notion that this is the real hand. And the reason that happens is because the perceptual side of the brain is getting two streams of perceptual information. It's got visual information. It sees the brush stroking the fingers. And it's got touch information. It feels the stroking on its real hand. And the combination of those two perceptual streams is enough to kick off this experience of adopting the rubber hand. And um, I'm going to let this woman here expl say in her own words what this is like. The feeling was really an, an awkward feeling, a very strange feeling of having a false hand belonging to me. We see, we visually see that the hand is false, but we can't uh, separate that from the fact that we actually feel our hand uh, 
uh, in that place. Okay, she feels that hand in that place. Uh, and if someone were to threaten that hand uh, when she's in this state, <laughs> as happened here, someone jumps in from the side of the frame, puts a fork into the rubber hand, and the guy with the blue shirt just instinctively pulls back his hand. Because perceptually, he's totally committed to the idea that that rubber hand is his real hand. I, I give you this uh, illusion to illustrate this, I think, very fundamental point that even at the most basic level of our, um, of our experience of reality, and I ask you, is there anything more basic than the way we experience our own bodies, our own body image? What this illusion is telling us is that even that is nothing more than a perceptual construct in our brains, and it's a construct that is amenable to manipulation. Now, as a human being, I have to say, I find this quite frightening, actually. As a filmmaker, I'm tantalized. I'm tantalized because I think, if you can get someone to experience a rubber hand as their own hand, simply by manipulating a few a sensory cues in their brains, then what could you do with cinema? Because I think cinema is nothing if not a kind of engine for delivering sensory information into the brain through the eyes and the ears. So this, again, will be something I want to follow up on in the 21st century, this idea that you could work directly in perception to create experiences. Uh, <clears throat> OK, so we're going to leave visual perception behind here. There is kind of one takeaway thought that I want to leave with you. Perhaps you have come to this thought yourself. Uh, <clears throat> and that is that the whole idea of visual illusions is in some ways rather misleading. It's misleading to the extent that it suggests that we go around in the world seeing the world as it really is most of the time, and then once in a while somebody confronts us with a visual illusion that tricks us into seeing the world in some inaccurate way. Folks, I'm here to tell you we never see the world in an accurate way. The pictures of the world that we have are the pictures that perception is capable of formulating and sending up into the conscious side of the brain. And these pictures are a response to the outer world, but they're hardly an accurate picture of the outer world. And they're certainly not a comprehensive picture of the outer world. They're a very thin slice, in fact. This is important to me as a filmmaker because I think if the lesson here is that um, our visual perceptual systems have evolved over the course of the evolution of, uh, of us as a species to deliver us images of the world which are not accurate images, which are not objective images, but which are useful images. Useful in the sense of helping us survive on the planet. That makes me think, well, if, we're, if we don't have an objective picture of reality, uh, then that's very suggestive, in my mind, of possibilities for ways to think about cinema, which is uh, a medium which uh, generates pictures of the world. Uh, so I just, I'll just leave that with you to, to see if that uh, sort of percolates in your brains the way it does in mine. All right, um, I'm going to take us towards this uh, early cinema clip, but I want to just uh, take a moment and say something about how I'm using these terms, continuity and motion, uh, in relation to cinema. And uh, I say of continuity that continuity uh, out of discontinuity is the fundamental illusion of cinema. And what I mean by that is that <clears throat> when we uh, see a movie on a movie screen or a uh, we watch a television screen, we experience that as a kind of continuous window of light. But what's really going on underneath to generate that is the on-off appearance and disappearance of a sequence of individual still pictures. That's a discontinuity generating a continuity, an illusion of continuity. And I think it's somewhat ironic that in the history of uh, the, the, the evolution of cinema as a technology, uh, <clears throat> this, what I'm calling the fundamental uh, illusion, which is this illusion of just continuousness, was a kind of byproduct of a push to get a specific continuity, which was the illusion of motion. We track film history basically starting in 1895. In the 1890s, photography had been around already for a while. People were accustomed to the idea that there was a kind of machine-based 
uh, technology for delivering images of the world that seem to have a rather high quotient of uh, objectivity to them. And I think the impulse to want to make images of the world in which we live is very fundamental, very deep, goes all the way back to the cave paintings. And by the 1890s, they had achieved a pretty high level of realism in the ability to picture the world. But what they lacked, of course, was motion. So there was a big push in the 1890s to get motion, and in 1895, with the invention of the motion picture camera and the motion picture projector, they got it. And with the invention of motion, we get the beginning of the film industry, of course. But from my perspective, or my um, interest here, that, what that gives us is the beginning of the ability to put onto screens the motions of the world, the naturally occurring motion of the world. And I cannot stress strongly enough how powerful this was for the first cinema audiences to see the motion, to see waves breaking on the beaches, to see leaves rustling in trees, or dogs running through the streets of Paris. This was incredibly powerful and inc incredibly gripping to the first cinema audiences. Now, it didn't last that long. Uh, the novelty wears off, and eventually cinema does migrate on to other missions. But in these very first days, which is the period I'm interested in, uh, this was spellbinding. And just to give you a, a flavor of this, um, I will tell you that at the first screening, the first public screening of projected movies, which was a collection of short films, both of the Paris newspapers wrote reviews of this show, or they wrote articles about this new technology, motion pictures. And both of the French papers said independently Something along the lines of, this new technology, motion pictures, has the power to overcome death itself. It said, they, they said things like, soon enough, your loved ones will live on in perpetuity in the motion pictures. Now, you know, that's a rather extravagant claim for this illusion of continuity and this illusion of motion that I've been talking about. But nonetheless, there it was. That's how they took it in 1895. Uh, and I just now want to just follow through here a little bit and say that uh, <clears throat> these issues of uh, continuity, uh, out of discontinuity, go to a lot of very long-standing uh, issues in both science and philosophy. It certainly goes back at least to the Greeks. You may remember Zeno and his four paradoxes. Uh, Zeno tried to prove that, uh, there we go, um, time, motion, and change were all illusions, that they weren't real. Um, and I ha have here, where is it? I have here this uh, issue of Scientific American, June 2010. It has an article in here called, Does Time Really Exist? I offer you this just to make the point that these issues are still in play. And I think cinema has had, in a kind of niche way, has done some work on these, I these issues, although primarily kind of on the philosophical side. And, um, I myself have had a, a question that I've been grappling with in my own filmmaking for probably 20 years, which is, on the one hand, at the level of uh, my filmmaking is a kind of pr very practical question. What is the difference between rapid change and motion? But I also think it's a kind of philosophical question. Uh, here, what, with these dancing O's, th this is an example of one of many uh, beta motion experiments that I've done. The question here is, do you see these uh, O's as in motion, or, you just, or do you see them flickering on and off in different positions in this field? Do you see any of the O's moving across the gap between one position and another? I'll leave it to you to decide whether this is motion or rapid change. Now I am ready to go into uh, the early cinema clip, and this, this is going to be a clip which will be very familiar to many of you, I'm sure. This is, uh, according to the textbooks, the first film ever made, Workers Leaving the Factory, made by the Lumiere brothers in 1895. The Lumieres were the inventors of the motion picture camera and the motion picture projector. And um, I have to say, this is a film I've always had an enormous respect and kind of affection for, uh, partly because it is the first film but beyond that, it's a film that puts motion at the center of attention and which sustains the entire length of the film on the basis of that motion. And in fact, what you're going to see is the motion of workers um, at the Lumiere Brothers 
factory in Lyon, France, sort of pouring out of these doors. Um, and I should tell you, they actually shot two versions of this. And I'm, you're going to see both versions here, uh, kind of running back to back. Um, and I, I'm going to apologize here, but I have to, I just wrote some notes on this last night, and I, I don't have it clearly in my head. So I'm going to read a bit here. I hate to do that. Um, all right. Uh, so the question that, that I have uh, about this film is, is how did the Lumiere brothers do this? How did they manage to uh, take this rather routine daily activity of workers coming out of a factory and turn it into what seems like such a kind of powerful visual composition? Um, this is, I think appreciable as, as almost a kind of visual music. And I'll be honest, that, this is how I see it. I see this as pure visual music. And so my question is, how did these guys, these people making the very first film, how did they do this? How did they manage this? What, I, what ideas uh, about cinema that, did they have that led them to this? What powers of cinema did they think they were tapping into? Well, I can't really answer any of those questions, but um, I think I can answer the practical question, which is how they did it, how they managed to turn this into this kind of what I would want to call visual music. And I think they did it um, simply by harnessing the power of the motion picture frame, um, which is really the, the, most, the simplest step one could make. But I think just by um, putting a frame around this activity, they lift it out of its historical moment in time, and, uh, and they make it, they, they package it in such a way that it can come to us now in our lived moment as a kind of object for contemplation. Uh, and I think um, it becomes abstracted by being contained inside the borders of this frame. Uh, and that goes to really one of the powers of cinema, which is the ability to capture and archive lived time. Okay, and we now, I think, as we watch this, we are able to find in it qualities, I think, um, because it's inside of this frame. We find aesthetic qualities. Um, and these aesthetic qualities, I want to suggest, kind of redeem this otherwise rather mundane moment. And that's one of the powers of cinema. That's one of the powers of art, really, I think, is that it can show us that the world all around us is a magic kingdom if we have the eyes to see it. Um, and possibly uh, you don't agree with me, but maybe you're not having that kind of involvement with this motion uh, as visual music. Uh, maybe it's just a delusion on my part or I'm reading into it, but I really invite you to look into this and see if you don't find this compelling, this flow, this, the, the dynamics of the crowd and uh, is there not something kind of essential here about the human condition uh, as seen through this, the vitality and the, the dynamics of this, uh, this, these interacting individuals who make up this crowd? That's my uh, sense of it. And that's what I want to take into the 21st century is this, just this simple kind of inspiration of A, that you can have films that are based entirely on motion alone and that you can do powerful things with very simple steps. Uh, just to put the frame around this uh, activity, I think, is what makes this a powerful thing. All right, so I'm going to leave this uh, behind. OK, I'm going to uh, jump us now in the 21st century. Uh, and I do want to say that I'm not going to try to speak for all of experimental cinema in the 21st century. That's a pretension I, I don't want to get into. So I'm just going to be talking about my own thinking and my own films uh, from here on out. And I want to talk about my films out of this uh, premise, which I hope uh, I've made at least somewhat plausible based on the uh, things I've get presented so far. And the premise is that um, as regards the evolution of visual perception, there is no normal. There are only pictures of the world provided by perception that are useful at a given time to help us survive in the world. And our perceptual capacities to develop these pictures of the world are themselves constantly evolving, which is just to say that perception as part of our biology is evolving across the sweep of evolutionary time. And I think that uh, that's just an important fact to establish so that we 
understand that our contact with the world, with reality, through our perceptual faculties, is not a fixed thing. It's neither fixed nor objective. It's contingent and uh, utilitarian, so to speak. Um, and so this is a, a little segment of a film of mine called Here, and I'm showing you this now to sort of underwrite uh, a, a rather simple statement I'm about to make. Simple, but I, I hope useful. Uh, and that is that experimental film experiments with new ways of seeing. And that, again, is an effort just to put the, this, this activity, this making and this viewing of experimental film, into, the, into a context of perhaps we can look at this, this activity as just a 21st century effort to evolve our perceptual capacities as a species, that we're responding to the same evolutionary pressure that, um, that always drives uh, adaptations and so on. Um, so I think that if, if experimental cinema is going to have a role in sort of nudging perception into the future, uh, the way that could be done would be by sending down into the perceptual side of the mind motions that um, both provoke and attract the perceptual mind. Uh, and when I'm talking about motions now, I'm talking about cinematic motions, and I'm really talking about my films now, um, which is to say that... Uh, my primary interest, that's the kind of driving interest, is with motion. And in that sense, I share uh, with the Lumieres and other early cinema uh, filmmakers that, that kind of uh, focus on motion. The difference is I'm not interested at this point in putting the motions of bodies in the outer world up onto screens or workers coming out of factory buildings. I'm interested in the possibility of trying to put onto screens something of the motion of our inner lives, particularly of our uh, minds. And I think to do that, we're going to need a kind of motion that's rather different than the familiar motions of the outer world. And so I think that uh, the kind of motions I'm going to need for that are what I'm calling abstract motion. <laughs> I use that term rather cavalierly because uh, one might wonder what is abstract motion exactly. Um, my kind of rubber meets the road definition is abstract motion would be a motion apart from something that's moving. I also now want to just lean on a, a turn of phrase by another experimental filmmaker, which I think is kind of useful, and that's uh, from the filmmaker Stan Brackage, who made uh, abstract films for 50 plus years, many of which were made by painting directly onto film stocks. And he used to very often talk about his films as being involved with what he called moving visual thinking. That's a set of words I like. That's a, a phrase I like. And I want to just appropriate it for the moment to sort of stand in for what I think might be the possibilities for these kind of abstract films that I'm interested in. Uh, but, it, but I also recognize that talking about moving visual thinking isn't necessarily that much clearer than talking about abstract motion. So I, I just want to develop this idea a little bit by showing you something about how we perceive uh, motion in the world generally. Uh, here's a slide with a bunch of sort of grayish white dots on it. I don't know if this slide uh, communicates anything to you or suggests anything to you. Let me put this slide into motion. Well, let me put this slide into motion, he says. All right. So I think you see, once it goes into motion, it, it almost instant, instantaneously becomes clear what we're looking at. These are two human beings dancing. And I give you this just to, as an example of, of something that goes on all the time in our brains, which is part of the way we process uh, information perceptually is we're working with motion information. And I think the neuroscientists would tell us that motion information is the most useful, the most valuable kind of sensory information for the brain to have when it's trying to figure out what it's seeing out there. And I don't know if I'm the only one, but I think I can tell not just that there are two human beings dancing here, but I think I know which one is the male, which one is the female. I'm tempted to think I know even something of their relationship based on just this motion information. So I'm, I'm interested in this uh, motion information. I'm interested in the idea that the perceptual side of our brain can analyze motion information in order to gain knowledge of the world. I just want to change the script slightly. Instead of sending down into perception the motions of the outer world, bodies moving in the outer world, I want to send down now uh, the abstract motions of my films. 
uh, and I want to send them down to perception and let perception grapple with those motions in the same way it grapples with the motions of the outer world, just to see what happens as they see. Um, and the question uh, that comes up is, will the perceptual mind read these abstractions as motion, or will it just see it as some kind of kinetic barrage or some kind of kinetic chaos? This is the issue that's kind of at the heart of my filmmaking that comes up in each and every film. Uh, <coughs> but I will say that the romantic side of me does believe that if the perceptual mind can read these things as being motion as opposed to just rapid change or chaos, that that is the coming into being of something we, we could call moving visual thinking. Um, boy, I almost hate to do this. Here's a uh, quote from Foucault. And um, <laughs> uh, I think this, uh, I'll let you read it. They say never read your slides. Um, Oh, I'm going to read it. There are times in life, uh, there are times in life on the question of knowing if one can think differently than one thinks and perceive differently than one perceives, than one sees is absolutely necessary if one is to go on looking and reflecting at all. So, I I, I turn to this just as a kind of truism about uh, something about human nature, which is that sometimes in order to progress and to uh, f find our way into new experiences, we kind of have to overturn the apple cart of our. Uh, habitual ways of responding to things. And these films that I'm involved with, I think, do in some way sort of challenge you along that line. Um, this, is, this is a little excerpt from a film of mine called The Afterlife. Um, <clears throat> I do think that if we could get this moving visual thinking going, that we would then also have done something I referred to earlier in the talk, which was release the intelligence inside of perception from its kind of straitjacket role of only uh, create, giving us pictures of familiar things from the world, that by bringing it into my creative process, and I'm doing that basically by making films, on the crafting them on the conscious side of my brain, sending them down into perception, seeing how perception responds, and then you know, altering or, or trying to work out the next film based on something I've learned. So there's kind of back and forth between the two sides of my brain. The point here is I would like to think the intelligence of perception is now actively engaged in, uh, in the making of the films. All right, so I'm almost at the end of the talk here. Um, I want to just sidetrack here and uh, give you a riddle, because I haven't given you any riddles so far. Uh, and the riddle is, why does the bull charge the red cape? I'm not going to uh, answer that riddle, give you the answer right now. I will try to give you an answer at the end of the talk, which is soon, but I will give you this hint. I'm showing you this because I think the answer applies to the uh, things I've been talking about right here. All right, there's one last aspect of these uh, abstract films that I want to try to discuss, and this is a little bit tricky. Um, but I think that one of the things that goes on when one is viewing these kinds of films um, is that in addition to, because the brain doesn't have any ready kind of off-the-shelf way to respond to this, this is not the familiar world, so the brain struggles a little bit, and that's I think, explains the, the kind of strenuousness that's often involved in watching these kind of films. It's not a terrible strenuousness. I've actually come to regard that as a, as a marker of films that I, I'm interested in, is that they, they're a little bit strenuous. Sort of like, remember when Jane Fonda had her exercise tapes and she used to say, no pain, no gain? A little bit like that. Um, but I think because the brain is struggling a little bit here, one of the things that's happening is that in addition to seeing whatever's passing across the, across the screen, you're also involved to some extent in uh, seeing yourself seeing. And uh, which is to say, you're having an experience of having an experience. And I think these kind of recursive mental loops are in some ways characteristic of, of higher forms of intelligence or at least a, a, a mind that's groping for uh, a higher form of intelligence. Um, so that's, that's just a kind of romantic idea. I, I, I really don't mean to be making claims about my films. Now. I'm just suggesting ways of thinking about these possibilities. Um, all right, I'm going to give you one last uh, metaphorical description of what I think these films can do, and then I'm going to stop. Um, <clears throat> and I should say, you know, there's always a problem talking about this in language, because these really are fundamentally not language-based experiences. Uh, here's my last attempt to put it into language. Uh, and I say, the films will function like 
fishing lures, trolling higher order abstract motions on the surface of the unconscious perceptual mind. I'm reading my slide again. If the perceptual mind bites on these uh, motions, and in the context of this metaphor, to say they bite means they see, the, see these abstractions as motion, as opposed to just chaos or rapid change, uh, that that will constitute the coming into being of new knowledge. On that note, I think I'd best stop because words, words will fail me. But I will give you the answer to that riddle. Uh, why does the bull charge the red cape? Well, it does, uh, I, somebody's got an answer, but see, I know some people know this. Go ahead, Vin. Motion. See, he's got it all down to one word. Um, he's right. The bull, uh, it's not the red and the red cape. That's the first thing to know. Bulls are colorblind. My contention is that it's the exact, it's the precise movements of both the cape and the toreador that actually brings about a change in the energy state of the bull. See, he now, the bull is kind of inert there, sort of curious or stationary, and then suddenly the bull becomes fully enraged and tries to gore the toreador. The analogy with the films would be that I'm, my films are like the red cape, and I'm flapping them in front of the viewer's eyes not to enrage viewers and get them to, <laughs> get them to you know, do the equivalent of goring their neighbor, but rather I, I am interested in the notion that you could work directly inside of the nervous system and create these kind of direct experiences. And um, all right, on that note, I'm going to stop. And uh, oh, there's that. Uh, and thank you all. There is a four-line four Emily Dickinson poem here to go out on, which. Uh, I think in her four lines, she, she captures a great deal of what I had in all my many words. I also want to just put up this last slide to let you know that uh, we're having a show over in the gallery of a small group of visual arts faculty, amongst whom is myself. If you want to see whether any of these things actually translate through into my films, come. You can also see the films of uh, Vin Grable and Cal, uh, Kathy Cook and work by Dan Bailey, Steve Bradley, and Cal Thompson. So, I hope you will all uh, consider coming to this show. Ta-da. <laughs>
you know, going to Hollywood to, to try to make it is, is like going into a black hole for most people. I mean, they wouldn't even let Orson Welles make films. So, you know, um, so I, I feel, okay, I, I can make my own films. And, uh, and with the digital, uh, you know, it's gotten really rather less expensive than it used to be when we worked with 60 millimeter film. Um, and there's a lot of it going on, as you know. I, I mean, if you turn in YouTube, or I mean, there's a lot of people working, uh, not necessarily with the understanding they're doing experimental film, but the, the notion that anybody can do it is sort of out there. Yeah. The film titles? Yeah, but in particular mm. the title for fear, because we've been talking a lot, you've been talking a lot about time, emotion, yeah. and beauty, and that title is, is very specifically dichotic, and very much about the here and now and stillness. I mean, that infers stillness. So could you talk a bit about that? that um, he, yeah, that was a film that I, I often have trouble with titles, and I it will come up with a title, and a, a number of people will tell me, no, you cannot possibly call it that. And that was the case here. I was going to call that <laughs> Georges Méliès versus Laurence Olivier at one time. Um, I think I called it here because... Um, I win too. <laughs> you like that, that one better? No, no. no, no, no yeah, right. I haven't found anybody to support that idea yet. Um, <laughs> that was Laure it was Laurence Olivier and uh, Méliès footage sort of clashing there. Um, here, I, 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 I use that title because it's, I think this is a kind of optical place. You know, it's not a geographical place. But uh, by, by intersecting, sort of dynamically intersecting these frames from these two areas, these clips, you know, I have a Melies clips and I got this Laurence Olivier scene of the, of the, which is from Henry V, by the way, I am an English major. Um, <laughs> it's from the movie Henry V, the horses riding across the country. Uh, so I, I think it, it sort of creates a new place, an optical place that has its own kind of characteristics as a place. Yeah, behind. I was, uh, was actually uh, wondering, uh, I think kind of an, I don't know, I was asking, is it an unintended consequence of uh, your presentation and your work that you stress like our perception is pretty bad actually? Um, is, are you stressing caution? Is like, are you saying that we should oh. No, uh, I, you know, I think um, that, that's a good question. You know, people often talk about film as sort of preying on the vulnerabilities of our perceptual. You know, how does this illusion of motion come into being? Well, it were, you know, our eyes are fooled. But our perceptual faculties have gotten us this far. Uh, so I don't think our perceptual faculties are weak at all. Um, they've evolved to to simplify, you know, we, we do really simplify uh, experience. I had at one point a slide in here which really tracked information from the point it lands on the retina of your eyes, travels through the optic nerve, goes into the back brain, and all, at every step it shrinks down the amount of data. Uh, but it simplifies it to make the world more manageable. Uh, if we had to deal with the full plate, I think we'd, it would be overwhelming. Um, so yeah, I, I think we're fine. I, I mean, I think that now, um, you know, perception is always kind of behind. We're way behind perceptually from our conceptual knowledge. You know, think about quantum mechanics or something, a particles in two, two places at one time. You know, you can't deal with that ex experientially. And another example I use is that we still talk about the sun comes up in the morning and the sun goes down at night. I mean, 400 years ago, Galileo said, wait a minute, no. You know, this, this, the sun does not go around the earth, the earth goes around the sun. And we all understand that conceptually, but at the level of experience, we still see the sun going around. So we're at least 400 years behind our conceptual understanding, <laughs> perceptually. Um, yeah. It's nice to see the, the linear piece again, especially Luke. Yeah. Right. Camera or capability. So how do you see that it, it, that widespread awareness now uh, impacting our perception? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, I sent students out. Some of them are here today, probably. Yesterday, to just go out on campus and interview students, uh, uh, you know, in a documentaryish way on a, on a topic, the best and the worst of UMBC. And when they came back, many of them said, 
Well, you know, a lot of students don't want to be interviewed. There's just a, now a kind of instinctive uh, feeling that, you know, it could end up on YouTube humiliating me for the rest of my life. You know, what's in it for me to be shot? Um, but I think that this Lumiere clip, uh, about the many features of it are, you know, it's an incredible, um, almost utopian kind of democracy there. Every one of those workers crossing through that frame is equally important to making that film work. Uh, you know, there's no standouts, no, no uh, superstars, there's certainly no movie star organizing how we see that action. And we as viewers have a kind of freedom too. We, we get to move around inside the frame in any way that we want because there's no narrative structure telling us how to do it. You know, in narrative, very skillful people are constantly trying to direct your attention through things in, in a very precise way. But with that film, you know, I've watched it many times. I doubt my eyes have ever tracked through it in exactly the same way twice. Um, Uh, I knew someone would trap me on one of these things. Okay, go ahead. And then uh, later you were talking about how with experimental uh, experimentations like on perception, we can gain new knowledge. What exactly did you mean by like new knowledge? Like what, what kind of areas did you wish to explore in that conscious side of the brain, I guess? Well, you're going right into the heart of this here, and, and this is tricky. Um, Okay, I, I, I believe that when we, that motion is like, uh, when we follow motion, our mind, uh, when our eyes track through motion, especially if it's kind of inviting motion, there's something aesthetic or something special about it, that our minds are moving as, the, as we follow the motion on the screen, and that mo movement of the mind is like a kind of thought, or it could tip over into being um, a kind of visual thinking if the motion that we're following is uh, is got some kind of um, something in it that's that, that that that's latent that can come out by our watching it, and, and in fact with the Lumiere clip, I I've often thought well maybe you know all these kind of compositional aspects of the thing that I appreciate that make this into visual music, maybe those things only that literally come into being through the act of us watching it. You know if we were standing on the curb outside of the building in 1895, I doubt we would appreciate it as visual music. But put it in the frame, get some distance from it, and study it with a kind of expectation the art, the expectation art brings, and all of a sudden we find these things in it, or at least I do. And maybe, you know, it's almost like that quantum thing of it's, uh, it's not in a, in a particular place until it's observed, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, sound is a really interesting thing. Um, I'm, I, when I was working at 16, a lot of my films were silent. And I still do believe that uh, silence concentrates the visual experience. And I, you know, I, I, I still make films silently, deliberately, for that reason. The whole sound picture relationship thing is, is a very fascinating, wide open thing as far as I'm concerned. I'm also really interested in that. Um, Stan Brackish, who I uh, was here, I, there's a clip of him when he was about 30 being interviewed by somebody. He said, sound was an aesthetic error. <laughs> um, and you know, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I've got lots of sound films, too. Um, it, it's, it, it's, um, it's another whole kettle of fish, you know, to work with sound picture relationships. Steven. I, I, was, I was struck by the, the static drop and then how quickly my brain recognized the two dancers. Like yeah. Drop and I, I thought about pattern recognition. Yeah. I'm wondering if you're experimenting with new ways of your viewers recognizing new patterns, and if so, what those new patterns are in your mind, if, if at all. Yeah, well, um, you know, when I, I have been very interested in visual perception, as you probably uh, picked up on. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things is, uh, uh, for instance, if you go into the textbooks even now today and, at, and the, the explanation of how the illusion of motion occurs in cinema, they'll tell you that it's persistence of vision and the phi phenomenon. Neither one of those things are true. Um, 
It, but so what, what is true is that there's a very complex set of cues that are being read at, at, from motion detectors, and you have all these kind of specialized centers in your brain that do one thing, but somehow it's all integrated, and, and how that's integrated is pretty mysterious as far as I can tell. I don't think the neuroscientists know either. There's no center, you know, there's no central command that's integrating everything. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I, you know, I just, I'm, a, I'm an, I know just enough to be dangerous in these areas, so to speak, you know. And um, once I, I gave a similar talk once um, recently, and uh, I discovered there were all these kind of neuroscience types in the audience, and I thought, oh my God. Um, and so I made this little speech about how artists have permission to be wrong, or to <laughs> artists have permission to misunderstand things, which I think is true. And sometimes, Misunderstanding something can, can be more fruitful, and, and you can't try to misunderstand it. You have to sincerely misunderstand it. <laughs> but um, but uh, I think sometimes things move forward by, through misunderstandings. So I'm, I'm not afraid to, <laughs> you know, recklessly careen around in these areas. Yeah, Tom? Digital? Well, really only one, that kind of black and white stuff that came in at one point, sort of um, spotted shapes. I, you know, my old 60 millimeter films, in order to get them onto digitally, it's expensive to do it well. I've got some kind of low-end uh, transcriptions of them, but I, I've never transferred them to a high-end DV, so I'm reluctant to show them as DV generally. Yeah. How is the thought process different for you? Digital to uh, cinema? Huge issue. Um, many, I think there's many things uh, one could say. Uh, with, with film, you get this kind of transcription, you know, and that's very much part of that uh, Lumiere thing. You know, a photograph is almost like a footprint. You know, the light rays bounce off these, the world, comes in and lays onto this photo surface, and really there's a kind of one-to-one -one relationship there. Uh, digital is uh, this algorithmic tra transformation of information. A video camera is like a computer with a lens on it, basically. Um, so it's already a, 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 a step of, of increased abstraction, I think, just the very technology. Y yeah? Well, what I'm getting at is people talk about films in terms of frames. Uh, as Individual as frames, images. yeah. But when you get to the electronics, it's really not that anymore, right? Now you're going into another tricky area, and I've been trying to, yeah, um, this would take some time, but digital projectors are somewhat mysterious to me. It's true that, um, but I, no, I think we still have, we have to have a still moment. We have to have a picture be still in order, you know, you can't take a piece of film and, and do this and get motion. It's, you know, it's done differently digitally than, than the shutter mechanism that's in a conventional movie projector. But, um, but I, I've asked many people how the illusion, I used to think that the illusion of motion required that there be this neutral black moment in between the frames. It was on, off, on, off, and in a, a, a film projector, the off moment is of equal length to the on moment, which means you watch a 60 minute film and 30 minutes of the time the screen is dark. Digitally, it's not quite the same. But there's lots of ways in which we're only getting, where the brain is filling in information. And that's, that's the crucial part to me. It's, it's, it's almost like a call and response thing in the brain. You know, you get a flash of information, the brain then does something with that, and that's how we get the illusion of motion. I, I know I, I didn't really answer that, because I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Oh, I love Hollywood films, really, for all the reasons you do. Um, but I'm, more, I'm not interested in them in the way that I'm interested in experimental cinema. Do you believe that narration films cannot be avant-garde, cannot be experimental? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't want to be like the pope of, you know, who, <laughs> making the rules and it all gets very kind of uh, tight. Uh, one of the top avant-garde films. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm only number 21, though. <laughs> if you were to go ni number 19 or 18, they could tell you the answer to this. Um, <laughs> there are, you know, I think, um, 
you know, it's true. There's a little competition here. I mean, the, the Hollywood guys always want to, on top of everything else, after they got the pool and the house in Malibu and they've succeeded, they also want to be artists, you know? Um, I, you know, there's, there's various definitions of art. It all depends. I, I don't want to say. I, I think there are certainly narrative films made with very experimental uh, kind of intentions and motivations and all that. Yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't draw a hard line there. I wouldn't draw a line to the level of intention and motivation. You might talk about formal, you know, how they're proceeding, but uh, yeah. I guess I'm following up on the previous question. I was, the use of the Kubrick clip caught my eye yeah. from the 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah. And at the time, that was sort of a strange edit, right? It's a visual edit, and there's no clue that the spaceship's supposed to be symbolically related to that bone. Right. Well, well, that is a you know that's a that's a cut that's an edit that compresses you know like a cent whatever you know four million years of time. So uh, my real question then is what what sort of relationship do you see avant-garde or experimental cinema to narrative cinema Hollywood cinema? Do you see them adopting techniques from experimental cinema? Oh, they steal from us all the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, actually, there's a famous there's a scene in American is it uh, Mer American Beauty? Do you know the scene where the blo the bag blows around? That was literally stolen from a Nick Dorsky experimental film, and they they admitted that Nick Dorsky filmed this little plastic bag caught in the wind, and it does this really very sensual dance, and he made a beautiful film out of it. Then they did the same thing, I'm sure, with all kinds of wind blowers and props and guys with threads and you know the whole thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot. I mean, if you look at, I remember when I used to show my films and people would say, oh, that really hurt my eyes, or, you know, I feel nauseous now. <laughs> I don't get that anymore at all because from the, just the speed, the flicker effect. You know, you to watch the average car commercial, it's going faster than I'm going these days. So I think, um, yeah, I think there's, they, they're looking at, uh, at what we're doing. Yeah. You know, they came from sharp film schools, a lot of these people took my classes, and now they're out making car commercials. <laughs> yeah? There's an illusion that involves motion. Um, I'll try to describe uh -huh. what I'd be interested in is your interpretation of it. It's a set of people who have a job of passing around a basketball. I know that illusion. It's a great one. Yeah. The gorilla. Yeah. Uh, lots of people don't see the gorilla. Right. That, I think that's called change blindness. Um, it, it's an amazing illusion he, he's referring to. They have, um, they, they got a bunch of people together and, and um, they, uh, four, maybe six or seven people and they are on a, in a room and they pass this basketball around. They, people, they get people to sit and watch this and they tell the people who are watching that this is an experiment. And they ask the people who are, who are the subjects to count the number of times. Uh, there's two teams, one is in white, T-shirts and one is in black T-shirts. They're passing this basketball around very furiously, and they're asked to count the number of passes that the white team makes. But that's really not what they're actually after at all. And then in the middle of the shot, a, a person comes out in a gorilla suit, really, and, and, and not only passes through the frame, but stands there going like this. And they, they ask the people afterwards, how many of you saw the gorilla? And almost nobody did, because they were preoccupied counting these passes. Which, you know, I think the one general lesson is whatever expectation you bring into to it is going to enormously affect how, what you see and what you don't see. But um, that's a really, another really shocking illusion, actually. Yeah. Uh, there's many of the, uh, like that where, you know, um, <clears throat> they did one with, um, they show people, uh, how does this go? Um, uh, well, I won't try to do it, but, but there's many examples of how, how unreliable our uh, vision can be in our memory of our vision and all these things. That's why, you know, pho photography cannot be evidence in court. It's just not reliable, you know. Well, please join me in thanking. Thank you. <laughs>